afraid of a global nuclear disaster? Or the likes of a Star Wars cosmic conflict? Are we on a countdown to the Battle of Armageddon? What does the future hold for our world? Have you tried to understand the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation only to be confused by all the symbols? These and many other amazing questions will be answered through this prophecy seminar. Yes, you can understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, and in the process, get to know God in a deeper way. Welcome to Prophecy Seminar, the book of Daniel. Here is your host, Pastor David Price. Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our Daniel and Revelation Prophecy Seminar. Tonight, we are looking at lesson number eight, and we are also going to find ourselves in the sixth chapter of the book of Daniel. Let's uh, begin our meeting with the most important thing we can do, which is to pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit will teach us exactly the points that you would like us to learn and to apply to our lives from these amazing stories and words that we'll read in Daniel chapter 6 this evening. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering this prayer and sending your angels and Holy Spirit to bless and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, if you look at the screen, it's kind of sad, but this is kind of one of the last nights that we're going to actually be sort of uh, metaphorically still in Babylon, uh, located in the city of Babylon for the actual story. And uh, I've entitled this Daniel chapter 6, Lions Under a Charm. I think that's a good way of uh, summarizing uh, the chapter. And the lesson, of course, is lesson number eight. And it's entitled Conflict Over True Worship. Please join me at the top of page two. If you've already done your lesson, then I'm encouraging you to look at the screen, sit back and enjoy tonight's presentation. In Daniel chapter three, the Bible says that the king endeavored to force the three Hebrews to false worship by insisting that they bow to his golden image. Nebuchadnezzar was unsuccessful in coercing them to false worship. In fact, in Daniel 6, there is an attempt to prohibit true worship. In the fiery furnace episode of Daniel 3, they could still have worshipped the true God. But in Daniel 6, there is a prohibition against worshipping the true God. Likewise, in the last days, the book of Revelation reveals that God's people will first be enticed to worship God falsely and finally will be prohibited from worshiping God truly. Friends, I'm going to pause there and ask you if you have a highlighter or a pen handy that you underline that sentence that is so important. The lesson says God's people will not yield on either point. That is being enticed to worship God falsely and prohibited from worshiping God truly. They will be as faithful as the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace and as Daniel in the lion's den. The reason for their steadfast faithfulness will be the same as it was for Daniel and his friends. They will have developed a strong personal relationship with their Lord. A relationship with God is the most important thing we can have as we enter the final scenes of Earth's history. Tonight I have five theme questions. Some are covered by the lesson and some aren't. Tonight I'm asking historically the question, who was Darius the Mede really? Now that's a question. Number two, you might have uh, asked yourself, where were Daniel's three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Thirdly, why were the laws and the Medes and Persians so unchangeable? Where did that come from? Four, what is the secret of Daniel's prayer habit of three times per day? And number five, what's the theme of Daniel chapter six? So here we are, we're in lesson eight, Conflict Over True Worship, and our theme chapter tonight 
is the end of the six uh, chapters of stories. And next week we go and start into the prophecies. Our first heading halfway down page two is the decree prohibiting true worship. Would you join me in question one? How many satraps, which the King James calls princes, were set over the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians? We go to Daniel chapter six and the first verse. Daniel writes, it pleased Darius. Now I've added in there in brackets that the dating of this chapter is 539 BC. So as you now look at the screen, I'm going to ask you, are we in the kingdom of gold still? Or are we now moving into the kingdom of silver? If you remember our lesson last week, the kingdom of gold finished with King Belshazzar. He was weighed in the balances and found wanting. And so, yes, we have moved from the head of gold to the arms and chest of silver. We are in the time of the Medes and the Persians. Let me start Daniel 6.1 again. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. Friends, the kingdom of Media was a huge kingdom and I will show you a map shortly. And so these administrators, sort of like councillors and, and heads of councils had to be regionally there to support a huge administration over a large area. If you're wondering about this strange word satraps, satraps is from the Latin and Greek and means protectors of the province. And so it can refer to the councillors of all those councils across the land of Media and of course Persia, but also some of the leaders of those councils like mayors. They would have been the mayors and maybe that is our modern equivalent to what the 120 satraps were. So our answer is how many satraps or princes were set over the kingdom of the Medes and Persians? Daniel recalls 120 satraps. Friends, before we go on, I have a question that relates to theme question number one. It's, this is not in the lesson. Please direct your attention to the screen. I'm going to ask the question now, who was Darius the Mede? This is a very, very interesting question. So Darius the Mede is mentioned four times in the book of Daniel, and I'm going to give you the four texts. Now, I'm not just referring to where his name's just mentioned, mentioned once in Daniel chapter six, but the main mentions of Darius. In Daniel 5.31, Darius the Mede, it's mentioned there that he received the kingdom at the age of 62. We covered that at the end of our lesson last time. And Darius the Mede was made king or he received the kingdom, the scripture said, over Babylon. The big question is who did he receive the kingdom from? And most of the commentators obviously mention that he received the kingdom from Cyrus. In Daniel 6.28, we'll be reading this tonight. So Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. I want you to notice there that those names are separate. It seems to indicate two different people, but I will come back to that. In Daniel 9.1, we read Darius was the son of Ahasuerus and Darius therefore was of Median descent. He was from the kingdom of Media. In Daniel 11 and verse 1, it says, in the first year of Darius the Mede. Now, Darius the Mede is not to be confused with Darius 1 that I've put there on the screen. Darius 1 was known as Darius the Great because Darius the Mede only reigned for about a year or two years at the max before he died. So Darius the Great was 521 to 486 BC. So our Darius the Mede is not Darius the Great. So what's our problem in trying to work out who Darius the Mede is? Our problem is no ancient document or historian other than Daniel ever mentions a person by this name. So the scholars and the commentators speculate as to the identity of Darius the Mede and they've come up with three options. Some say he was Cyrus, that is Darius was Cyrus, they were one and the same person. Secondly, there's a name Cyaxares or Cyaxares or Guberu or Gabrias. 
Number one, some say Darius the Mede was Cyrus and that Daniel was just giving Cyrus a throne name, meaning Darius. Others say no, they were the same person. Then there's Guberu. And Guberu or Gabrius was listed in the Nabonidus Chronicle as actually conquering Babylon. So that's an interesting development. The third option is Cyaxares and Xenophon, the Greek historian, names him as the last Median king whose daughter married Cyrus. Now, there's no other source really to support Cyaxares um, apart from Xenophon, but I'm not really worried because Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1 speaks about Darius being the son or the grandson of Ahasuerus. And so Daniel was correct about another name that couldn't be found in ancient history. In Daniel chapter 5, do you remember the king's name that history had long forgotten and the Bible was called a book of myths and legends? And that name starts with B. I can hear you calling it out. It's King Belshazzar. Let me go to the second screen on who was Darius the Mede. Did you know that Darius was a ruling name? It means he who holds the scepter. It means the royal one, the king. Going back to Daniel 9 and verse 1, in the first year of Darius the son, he was actually the grandson of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes. So Darius is from the forefathers of the Mede, the Median kingdom, the Medes who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So he's now made king of Babylonia. Let's get some history and background on this. Now, Ahasuerus or Cyaxares had a son whose name was Astyges or Astyages, depending on where you were brought up. His grandson was called Cyaxares II and he inherited the Median throne after his father's death. Now, before we get too carried away, this Ahasuerus there is not the King Ahasuerus, also known in the Greek as Xerxes, who was the king in Esther's time. King uh, Ahasuerus or Xerxes does not turn up for another 53 years. I've put that on the screen. He doesn't turn up till about 486 BC, so don't get confused on that. Xenophon, the Greek historian, says Darius the Mede was the biblical name for Cyaxares II. So Cyaxares II, or Darius, had a sister named Mundane. Friends, if you're unhappy with your first name, how about the name Mundane, that poor girl? So Darius's sister named Mundane became the mother of Cyrus. Now, all of this is recorded in the uh, Bible commentary, the four SDA Bible commentary, pages 815 to 817. This whole page, this whole view is supported by four SDA BC. You can look it up, 815 to 817. And so to summarize, who was Darius the Mede? The position is that the harmonious relationship between Darius and Cyrus was because they were related, with 62-year-old Darius being the uncle and the father-in-law to 40 year old Cyrus. Friends, at the end of the day, there were three options. They're all possible. The question is, are they probable? And tonight, the answer is, we really don't know, but it's always fascinating to go through the options. Please come back to uh, question number two at uh, halfway down page two. So how many governors were over the 120 satraps or princes in Daniel 6, 2 and over these, that's all the 120 satraps, there were how many governors? Three governors of whom Daniel was one. Now, it's not always clear if Daniel was one of the governors or whether he was over and above the governors, but we'll continue on. That the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. How many governors were there? over the 120 satraps or princes and pretty much the counselors in the kingdom of Media and Persia, the answer is three governors. Sometimes I've read the commentators call them three presidents. Question three, who was preferred among the three governors in Daniel chapter six and verse three? 
Then this Daniel, and I've added that you need to remember how old Daniel is here. Daniel is 85 to 87 years old. He's doing well, isn't he? Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps. Notice he was above them because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him, Daniel, over the whole. Well, what does that mean? I'll put a note here on the screen. The whole means that some commentators say that Daniel was uh, going to be made the new prime minister over the three governors. But some go even further and say that uh, the relationship between Daniel and King Darius was so close that Darius, who was failing in health, even and, and was, uh, you know, of old age, uh, saw Daniel as an actual replacement for himself. Question three said, who was preferred among the three governors? The scripture reminds us that it was Daniel. Why? Because there was an excellent spirit in him. That is, the Holy Spirit was in him, and he, of course, was linked to the great God of heaven through his beautiful and powerful Holy Spirit. This is an amazing story. He was a man who served as prime minister in Babylon. He was made the third ruler in Babylon on the night Cyrus conquered Babylon, and now the Medo-Persians were willing to place Daniel in charge of the affairs of all the, all the new kingdom. What a testimony to the righteous character of Daniel. All of these rulers knew that he could be trusted because of his relationship with God. Friends, we need to ask now, where were Daniel's three friends? Some felt they might have been demoted during Belshazzar's reign. So where were the three friends? Where's Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Where's Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah? The honest truth is we don't know exactly where they were. They're not mentioned again after Daniel chapter 3 and verse 30, the chapter on the fiery furnace. Commentator Jacques Ducan writes the following. The absence of the three Hebrews in this context, as well as the absence of Daniel in chapter 3, does not result from cowardice. Had they found themselves in the same circumstances, their reaction would have been the same. Events now restrict themselves to a higher administrative level involving only Daniel. Question four. Could the scheming governors and satraps find any fault with Daniel? We go to verse four. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge. They could find no fault. Why? Because Daniel was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him. He sounds like he's perfect. Question four, could the scheming governors and satraps find any fault with Daniel? No, they couldn't. And they would have been absolutely infuriated by that fact. I want you to remember that Daniel's in his late 80s. Do you remember what he's eating? In Daniel chapter one, he requested vegetables and water. This guy is on a total vegan diet. He doesn't want any dairy products. He doesn't want any meat. He wants to keep his mind totally sharp to be a pure vessel for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and be able to link heaven and earth and bless not only the Babylonian kingdom that's passed away, but to bless the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Daniel was God's man in Babylon. I want to ask you tonight, are you God's man or woman? Are you God's son or daughter where you work? Where you live, in your street, with your neighbours? Are you representing God a right to other people? Are you a great example of God's love and a great witness for the kingdom of heaven? I think that's something we can all think about. No matter how carefully the satraps searched, they could find nothing against Daniel. He didn't cheat on his income tax. He didn't keep two sets of books. He was honest in what? everything he did. Join me at the top of page three. Question five, what was the one area of Daniel's life where the satraps found fault in Daniel 6 and verse 5? Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Friends, there's the answer, the law of his God. Let's translate this um, scripture to today. 
in this society and this day and age in which we're living? Do you think the law of God could be an issue in these last day events that we are going through right now? I want you to think about that while I read the note. Notice that the same issue arises again. Daniel ends up in conflict, and the conflict's over what? The law of God. Please have a look at the screen. Here we have the Decalogue. Deca means 10. Log means word um, or law. And so here we have the Decalogue, the 10 commandments of God. Obedience to God's law and how we worship God were the issues of the conflict. These issues come together in chapter 6. Because the stories of Daniel illustrate the crisis in the end time, we can expect that in the final crisis, the issues will be the same. There's going to be a conflict over God's law and how people worship God. Friends, I find a lot of Christians today want to tell me that the law has been done away with at the cross. that We no longer have to keep it. So I often think about do people want to get into a little bit of stealing, a little bit of cheating, a bit, little bit of lying, a little bit of coveting. They say no. And they also want to worship God and not have false gods and blaspheme his name. So it seems like there just seems to be one law that they're very hostile to. I want to ask the question tonight, was Jesus Christ ever hostile to the law of God? In John 15, 10, this is not in your lesson. This is what Jesus said. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. You know, friends, if you are having a true relationship with Jesus Christ, the son of God, then you will be obedient and you will do these things out of love. Love is the only motive worthy that leads to obedience. Question six, what request did the scheming satraps make of King Darius? Friends, that word satraps, if we take off the SA, what are we left with? Ah, traps. Isn't that interesting? Why do I make that point? Because these guys were really good at setting traps for people they hated. We're in Daniel 6, 6 to 9. So these governors and satraps throng before the king and said to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree. Friends, there's one word there I've underlined. All. When people come to me and say, everybody's saying this and everybody's doing this, I always ask the question, really? Everybody? So I'm asking the question tonight. Were all the governors, administrators, satraps, counselors, and advisors, were they all against Daniel? Did they even all know Daniel? I find that hard to believe. We're in Daniel chapter 6, and we've read verse 7. Let's go on to verse 8. They were saying that whoever petitions is our answer. The satrap said that whoever petitions or requests any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. They're in a hurry to get him to sign it. Friends, do you remember we discussed, I think, in lesson one, we discussed whether Daniel was a book written in the second century, as many liberal scholars say that it's history, or whether it's written in the sixth century, as we believe, and that it's prophecy. Friends, I want to tell you tonight, this verse tells me when it was written, because here Daniel writes, I believe in the sixth century, in the 500s BC, he speaks about the law of the Medes and Persians. Later on, people only remembered that it was the Persian Empire. They forgot, as history went on, that the Medes started it. It was a coalition, a dual empire, and then later the Persians took over. Friends, here tonight is the historicity of Scripture, the truthfulness of Scripture that Daniel talks about, the law of the Medes, because the kingdom of Media ran things first, and then the Persians took over. 
I think that's absolutely fascinating. So let's have a look at the area of media. This is uh, something extra I've got for you. Please have a look at the screen. So you can see on the left in the purple, we have Egypt. Then in the middle, we have Babylonia in the red, but the green area is the kingdom of the Medes. It goes all the way from the very top left-hand corner, Cappadocia, which is in the area heading over to Turkey, all the way down to the Persian Gulf. See down the bottom there in the green, the uh, Kingdom of Persia and the headquarters Pasargade. And then over across on the right, you will know there that today on the right hand side where it says um, Gedrosi at the bottom, the Arabian Sea there, that is Pakistan. And on top of that is Afghanistan. So if we were to ask today, where are the kingdoms of Babylonia, Chaldeans or the Medes and Persians, what would they approximate to? Then I'm going to show you here what they approximate to in the next slide. But just before I do, notice the little kingdom of Persia down the bottom there. It says Persia and Pasargada in 559 BC. It then conquers the rest of it. And uh, this is the Persian Empire of Cyrus the Great from 559 to 530 BC. You can see it's a massive kingdom. You can now understand why they needed 120 satraps who could have been mayors over local councils and three governors or three presidents. Friends, here is a map showing us that ancient Babylonia today is Iraq. I think as I shared last week. And there we have the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, which is today called Iran. So I hope that's helpful with you understanding ancient geography and modern geography. Well, what request did the scheming satraps make of King Darius? Sorry if you've been raised on King Darius. I was raised on King Darius. So I hope you'll give me a leave pass tonight on that one. The answer was whoever petitions any God or man for 30 days except you, O King, shall be cast into the den of lions. These scheming satraps tried to flatter Darius into thinking that he was so important that folks should make requests of him only. Since all these ancient emperors liked to think that they were gods, Darius signed the decree, not realizing the intent of the satraps to destroy Daniel. Here was a decree signed by the government that said that Daniel could not pray or worship God, a total prohibition against the worship of the true God. Friends, I just want to have a comment here on the law of the Medes and the Persians and why it was unchangeable. And I want you to also note there that the king is uh, pressing his signet ring into some uh, hot wax there and would make a seal that showed that the decree had come from him. Friends, the Greek writer Sicilus mentions the attitude of Darius the second, not our Darius, Darius the Mede or Darius the first, the great, but the Greek writer Sicilus mentions the attitude of Darius the second to a man called Karademos, who was sentenced to death. The king then repented of sentencing Karademos to death, but the law could not be changed because the law of the Medes and Persians was set in concrete. Why was the laws of the Medes and Persians set in concrete? I'm going to tell you at the end of the lesson when we go through the theme questions, and I think you will be surprised. Our second heading tonight is Daniel's prayer life, and we are halfway down page three. Question seven, what did Daniel do when he knew the decree had been signed by the king? Does he change his behavior, friends? Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem because they always prayed toward the temple. Daniel knelt down on his knees. Here's our answer three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom or habit since his early days. What a brave man. What did Daniel do when he knew the decree had been signed by the king? Friends, he prayed three times a day. You know, Daniel must have known about the prince's plotting. I'm sure the other uh, advisors there to the king told him. But friends, when a Jew is put in charge of Babylon's 
the Babylonians and then the Medes and the Persians, there's always going to be jealousy. There's always going to be trouble. And there's always going to be the ugly specter of anti-Semitism being raised again, the hatred of Jewish people and the Jewish nation. Daniel did not change his prayer habits when the decree was signed. He could have prayed in his closet, but that would have been hiding his faith. Instead, he went over by the open window and did exactly as he'd done every day before. He prayed three times daily to his God. Here was the secret of Daniel's power. This was the reason for Daniel's great strength in Babylon and Medo-Persia. If there was ever a time when Daniel needed to pray, it was now. Nothing could keep him from worshipping God. Had Daniel changed his prayer habits under pressure, he would have denied his relationship with God. Some people might feel that this was a small thing, that he could have prayed secretly and no one would have known the difference. In that way, he could have avoided, as we go over the page, the lion's den. But to Daniel, obedience to God was more important than life itself. He would not give anyone the opportunity to think that he was not faithful to his God. A relationship with God was more important to Daniel than life itself. I'm just going to pause here and reflect on the point that prayer changes things. I want you to look on the screen. Friends, do you know the difference between the urgent and the important? Because I don't think we often do. I think we get them mixed up. What is the difference? You see, our life is full of the urgent things we work on, but the important things are really urgent. So our answer here is the urgent things always seem important and the important things really seem urgent. So what's the punchline? The bottom of the screen. I want to ask you tonight to remember to make your relationship with God absolutely urgent, urgent, urgent every morning, every day so that it will become the most important thing in your day. Just like Daniel did. Friends, I want you to remember to make your relationship with God urgent, and then it will become important. Do you know what you were worrying about this time last year that was absolutely urgent? You probably don't. And that might mean that it wasn't important. But if you could go back 12 months and know that you'd started a very consistent, daily devotional prayer life with God and Bible study and that after 12 months you are locked into that then that would have been the most important thing that you'd ever done maybe tonight you can ask yourself in 12 months time from tonight will you be faithfully spending time in God's word and in prayer with him that's the example of the man on the screen that's the example he's giving us tonight that prayer really changes things Question eight, when the satraps saw Daniel praying, what did they report to King Darius? Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication or request before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Friends, when the satrap saw Daniel praying, what did they report to King Darius in Daniel 6, 11 to 13? That Daniel prayed three times a day. So friends, what does the three times a day mean? There it says, in Psalm 55 and verse 17, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. That's Psalm 55, 17 in the words of David. So friends, the ancients, in terms of the people of God, they counted 
the day beginning at sunrise. And so they had three periods for prayer. The morning was the 9 a.m. prayers, then there were the noonday prayers, and then there were the evening prayers. This also approximated to the time when the ancient sanctuary service had the morning and evening sacrifices. Yep, the morning and evening sacrifices at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So there's the meaning of the three times a day, 9, 12, and 3. Friends, the satraps did not hesitate a moment. As soon as they saw Daniel praying as he'd always done, they reported him to the king. Now they could get even. They could get rid of Daniel and no longer would they have to worry about his honesty. They could cheat the king and Daniel would never report it. He would be gone. Friends, you know what? We would call these people dobbers, wouldn't we? We'd call them dobbers, dobbers, dobbers. All right, let's go to heading number three. We're at the bottom of page four. Daniel in the lion's den in question nine. How did King Darius feel when he realized what the scheming satraps had really planned? And we go to verse 14. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So how did King Darius feel? He must have felt sick in the stomach and he was really upset with himself because he wanted to deliver Daniel. Friends, have you ever been tricked? Have you ever been duped, deceived and ripped off? Then that's how the king felt. He was disgusted because he saw through the plot. He saw through the satraps, he saw what they were trying to do to remove his friend Daniel from leadership in the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Let's go to the note. Now that Darius saw what the satraps were up to, he did his best to deliver Daniel. He tried to find a way out of the law, but the satraps had written the law all too well. So Daniel was now heading for an appointment with the lions. Just going to ask you to pause for a moment there and just take a little break. I'd like to share with you from the book, Daniel, Hostage in Babylon by Kendall Down. And I'm going to page uh, 45. I want to give you some background info on lions. Some people say this Daniel and the lion's den could never have happened. Let's pick up the story in, in uh, page 45. From earliest times, the rulers of the Mesopotamian countries had enjoyed the pleasures of the chase. We're talking about the chase of wild animals. Although all wild animals were legitimate prey, the greatest thrill and most valued achievements came from killing lions. These were a smaller variety than the huge cats of Africa. Archaeological evidence seems to indicate that they're about the same size as an American puma or mountain lion. Lithe and swift of movement, they were dangerous prey to hunt with primitive weapons such as spears or bow and arrow. The wholesale depredations of such rapacious hunters as the Assyrian kings had resulted in near extermination of the lions, particularly in the settled environments of great cities like Babylon, as you can see on the screen. The solution was to hold the animals in cages or dens where they could be kept until required for a hunt. Assyrian reliefs depict the beasts being transported in cages and on sleds and then released at the site chosen for the royal recreation. Obviously, these animals had to be fed and no doubt the occasional condemned criminal was a welcome change to the standard diet of unwanted, awful and unwary pie dogs, as well as relieving the expenses of the royal exchequer. This was the fate that had been laid down for Daniel. I want you to come with me to question 10. We're at the top of page five. Although Darius was forced to put Daniel into the lion's den, what remarkable statement of faith did Darius make? We're going to verses 15 and 16. It's great tonight being in the one chapter, just being able to logically go through verse to verse. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king established may be changed. 
So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Friends, isn't that amazing statement of faith? Darius is 62, Daniel's 87. Daniel must have been a mentor to King Darius. And so he says, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. What a statement of faith by a pagan king. Even Darius knew the secret of Daniel's success. Perhaps he'd heard some of the stories of Nebuchadnezzar and knew that God had delivered the Hebrews in the past. Therefore, he expressed faith that Daniel's God could deliver him again. Interestingly, Darius notes that Daniel serves God continually. Darius knew that the secret of Daniel's success was his relationship with God. Friends, I want to ask you tonight, can you serve God continually? Is that actually possible? Well, I think it is. I think we can um, connect with heaven all the way during the day. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says that we are to pray without what? We can pray without ceasing while we're doing our work. I remember a friend that I had in Western Australia in the 80s. His name was Keith, and he worked as an orderly at the local hospital. He told me, Pastor, he said, I do an hour of praying at work. I said, what? Tell me more about that. Oh, he said, it's easy. He said, pretty much I have to uh, wash the bins out before I start um, full on the wards as an orderly. So from six to seven every morning when I'm washing the bins out, that's when I spend my time talking to the Lord. Friends, we can pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean to be on your knees all day. Praying without ceasing means to be in an attitude of mind of praying to the God of heaven, of asking God, and telling God our problems, sharing our joys and sorrows, that's how God wants to be involved in our lives. Question 11. How did the king spend the night while Daniel was in the lion's den? Well, the answer to this is going to show the closeness of the relationship or lack of closeness between Daniel and King Darius. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords. Do you notice that? He has it overprinted and overstamped so that nothing can go wrong here. That the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. The king knew there was a risk to Daniel, and it wasn't just from the lions. Daniel 6.18, now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. That word musicians is interesting. When you drill down to the root word, what is it? The root word is diversions. No diversions were brought to him that night. There was no uh, heavy food. He didn't want a heavy meal. There were no dancing wing and no concubines. The king was distressed he could not concentrate on anything and he could not sleep because of his friendship with daniel and so the king spent the night fasting he must have felt absolutely sick at heart for being duped and deceived by his advisors and also worried sick about daniel even though he'd expressed a word of faith darius could not sleep that night he was deeply troubled about Daniel. Why? Because he had had to seal the tomb with his royal seal to stop the plotters killing Daniel and then throwing his body back down there. That's what he was worried about and saying that the lions had killed Daniel when the plotters had actually killed him. All right, where are we up to? We're halfway down page five and question 12. What did the king discover very early the next morning when he came to the lion's den? We're in Daniel 6, 19 to 22. Then the king arose very early in the morning. That'd be easy if he wasn't sleeping. Well, and he went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? then he waited and then he heard a voice then daniel said to the king "O king live forever my god sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because i was found innocent before him and also O king 
I have done no wrong before you. So what did the king discover very early the next morning? He found to his amazement that Daniel was still alive. And Daniel quotes what happened. Daniel has faith, the eye of faith. And he says, my God sent his angel and shut the what? Shut the lion's mouths. Friends, something interesting here that I learned in my study. If anyone survived the torture and the death decree in ancient Medo-Persian times, they got a reprieve from the death decree. And so the king would have known if Daniel was alive in the morning, he could be saved. How happy Darius was. Daniel was alive. His God had delivered him. I want to read the text on the screen and then I want you to have a little break for a moment. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him. That's Daniel 6, verse 23a. I want to go to Secrets of Daniel, Jacques de Kahn's amazing book, and I want to take you to page 94 and comment on what's going on and what went on in the den of lions that night. Again, as in chapter 3, salvation comes from above as God sends an angel. Beyond our power, salvation has its origin outside of ourselves. Daniel is not rescued by his own wisdom, nor by a superior display of courage. But because he had trusted in his God, faith saves him. Daniel had saving faith. Let me read the scripture on the screen. No injury whatever was found on Daniel because he believed in his God. I want to ask you tonight, do you have that same saving faith in the God of heaven? Daniel was innocent, Dukan writes, verse 22, but that was not enough to rescue him. Daniel needed faith for God to send an angel. But faith does not exclude justice. Though salvation is from God alone, faith cannot exist without works, without a response in deed and action. It is because Daniel has faith in God that he remains innocent. Religion is more than just believing in God's salvation. It's living it. It's fighting in the present with God's help. People have often relegated religion to the abstract level of fleshless dogma, frosted with beautiful emotions. Daniel's experience gives us an example of incarnated religion, that is, a religion that's lived out in the flesh for everyday life with its efforts and uncertainties. I love the way Dukan writes. It's absolutely beautifully poetic almost. Question 13, we're halfway down page five. What command did the king give concerning the scheming satraps? Well, this isn't going to be good. Now, the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Friends, there's the saving faith I was speaking about. Let's go to verse 24. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who'd accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So the king gives a command that the plotters are going to be thrown and cast into the den of lions. Friends, this raises an important point. The note says the lions were indeed unfed and hungry. This is further proof of God's miracle working power in keeping Daniel from harm. Have a look on the screen. I want to quote here Daniel 6 and verse 24. And the plotters were thrown in. Friends, the question is the plotters against Daniel were thrown to the lions. Why? Why were they thrown in? Why the wives and children? Why were they all cast into the lion's den? The answer is the families of the plotters had to be killed to stop any organized revenge attacks either on Daniel, the prime minister of the Medo-Persian Empire, or on the king. And so, friends, verse 24 says on the screen, were the lions not hungry that night? 
that when the plotters were thrown in, the lions tore and broke all their bones in pieces, tore them limb from limb before they even hit or reached the bottom of the den. And so we are shown that the angel shut the lion's mouths that they did not hurt Daniel that night. But the next morning, they were plenty hungry enough. Let's not even think about that. Question 14, what decree did Darius now make in 625 to 28? Then King Darius wrote, this sounds like Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? To all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. Friends, there's echo there of the kingdom of the stone in Daniel chapter 2. And verse 44, his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure unto the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders. There's our answer. In heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel, verse 28 says, prospered in the reign of Darius. I've added in there the Mede. And in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Friends, Daniel wrote this verse himself. Can you see that I believe, and I think that you'll see the logic of this, that there are two distinct people. There's the reign of Darius, King Darius, the Mede, the Median king, and also in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And those were the points that we made earlier as to who was King Darius really. So the message here is not to worship the gods of wood or stone or gold or silver. We must worship the living God. And that is the name of the God of Israel. And even King Darius knew that. We're at the top of page six. What a tremendous witness Daniel was. Two world rulers, Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, were brought to acknowledge the true God because of the tremendous witness of Daniel. But let us not forget the key to Daniel's successful witness, his personal relationship with his God. And so I now want to read to you verse 28. And I want to ask the question. So why was Daniel able to survive two alien kingdoms? Why was Daniel able to get through the kingdom of Babylonia and the kingdom of the Medes and Persians? Why was Daniel able to survive them? The answer is simple. Because God was on Daniel's side and Daniel was on God's side. The question I want to ask you tonight is, and ask myself, whose side are we really on? Are we really 150% on the side of the God of heaven, the God of Israel? Are we? Are we living a life that reflects him in every way? Are we just keen and we can't wait to study our Bibles every morning? Friends, if that's a life that you would love to have, I'm asking you tonight to ask God for that life. I'm asking you to pray about it and say that you want that closer walk with him. Friends, I don't think things can get any later if you know the signs of the times, the society we live in, the loss of freedom, and soon the loss of religious freedom. I think that's all I'll say at this stage. Let's go to question four, the importance of a relationship with God. Number 15, how important is a relationship with God? We want to go to the prayer of Jesus in John 17 and verse 3 when he prayed to the Father. Jesus said, this is eternal life. He actually meant this is the formula for eternal life, that they may know, who's the they? The disciples, his followers, that they may know you, meaning the Father, and that you are the only true God. How important is the relationship with God? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. Friends, it's eternal life to know Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important than a relationship with God. It's the most important thing in the world. I'm asking you tonight, what are you doing about it? How late do you want to leave it to start a relationship with God that's consistent and loving 
and motivated. You can have it tonight if you ask for it. I promise you, I know that. 16, how did Daniel develop such a deep personal relationship with God? We go to verse 10. Then Daniel knew when, now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. So friends, you know, when he prayed, you know the three times he prayed and he prayed three times a day. You know, friends, I've had people say, I don't really think this is a big deal, him praying at the window. Um, has anyone forgotten the death decree? Maybe just have a little bit of sympathy with Daniel. Maybe I could ask you this question. I want you to imagine that I take you to a very, very expensive restaurant and the waiters are bustling around. There are people close at other tables and the waiters are coming to talk to us at the table and I'm shouting you a meal. And then I say, uh, would you mind saying the grace? That is the prayer before the meal. And then you realize the waiter's about to come back with the first course and you are put on the spot. Friends, some of us would balk at a prayer in a restaurant. Daniel opened his windows as he always did and prayed toward Jerusalem to the God of heaven, knowing that to do so was a suicide mission. He was a kamikaze pilot. Can you even imagine what's going through his mind? I don't even think he's worried about it. I think he knows that his relationship with the God of heaven is so strong that if he loses his life, like the three Hebrew worthies in chapter three, it's of no concern to us. But God can deliver him. But Daniel doesn't know if God will deliver him. The secret of Daniel's success, the reason he had such a deep personal relationship with God was the large amount of time that he spent with God. His was not a hasty prayer in the morning or the evening. Three times each day, he spent time in special communion with God. The only way in which we can develop a personal relationship with God is to spend time with him. Because Daniel spent his quality time with God, he could make it through the lion's den. In the last days, when the apostate power will prohibit the true worship of God and impose false worship and disobedience to God's law, only those who have, like Daniel, developed this personal relationship with God will be able to withstand the trials of this time. No earthly relationship can be thoroughly established unless people take time together. A husband and wife will grow apart if they don't set time aside to develop their relationship. Likewise, a Christian who does not spend time with his God will not be prepared for the final scenes of earth's history. The secret of Daniel's success is his prayer life, his relationship with God. Now, friends, this is my final um, prayer slide that I use at the end of each of the lessons. So where did I get these words from? Well, didn't we just read them roughly? The secret of Daniel's success, I'm reading the end of the note under question 16. The secret of Daniel's success is his what? Is his prayer life, his relationship with God. I want to just show you something on the screen. Friends, trials and crises do not make men and women. Trials and crises reveal men and women for who they really are and who they really trust in. When the going gets tough, those who rest on the God of heaven get going. Those are the ones who will and can endure because their relationship with God is connected and it's solid and it's stable. We're not gonna be able to get the relationship with God that we need in a huge panic in the last day events. We're gonna need that relationship today. You need a strong bedrock so that when these things happen, you know God's word, you have a strong prayer life, and you are not worried about what's gonna to happen to you. You are only worried about the authority and the reputation and the character of God. That's what needs to be on our minds a heavenly viewpoint. What does heaven think about me? Not does what do the people in the restaurant think about me? Or what will the waiter think when he comes over and I'm saying the grace? Friends, that's earthly thinking. Get rid of it. Chuck it out. How can the Christian maintain his relationship with God? Second Timothy 3.15. 
Paul writes to the young minister Timothy, and that from childhood, Tim, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we are to study the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God, the Bible, which are able to make us wise for salvation. The Christian who's building a relationship with God will spend much time studying God's sacred word, and the Christian will not only study but will follow Bible principles. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Bible study and prayer are the essential ingredients in building a solid personal relationship with God. In the final crisis, the issue will be the same. A relationship with God that enables the Christian today to obey the commandments of God. I heard a story once about a mum who left a note in her son's Bible, and this is what she wrote in her son's Bible. Son, either this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Let all the people say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Question 18, what is Bible study actually profitable for? Why should we do it? In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul's still writing to Timothy. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning it's God breathed. It originates in God. It's inspired and given by God. And it's good for four things. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and for instruction in righteousness. There are our four answers, doctrine, reproof, correction and instruction in Righteousness. I want to explain to you the four goals of Scripture. Number one, you know, churches don't want to really get involved with doctrine today because if you follow the doctrines of the Bible, then you will find that you're actually against where our society is now heading. Society has turned in the last few years very, very much so it's anti Christian. And Christian beliefs are being challenged, and Christian beliefs can be even seen as hate speech. In terms of reproof, the Bible tells us where we've gone wrong and tells us to quit doing wrong. It also tells us how to get right. Often people just offer criticism, but they don't offer any remedy. The Bible tells us how to get right. The Holy Spirit will tell us and God's word will tell us. And finally, it tells us how to be saved. The goal of scripture is that you will be in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lord. Bible study will help us discover what is correct doctrine. It will reprove us of our sins. It'll correct us where we've gone wrong. It'll provide instruction in the pathway of righteousness and it'll let us know the way that we should go. 19, what will be the result of a proper study of the word of God? 2 Timothy 3, 17, that the man of God, can I answer and add in here, the woman of God, the child of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, the Bible is preparing us for this time of trouble, which I believe we've already entered. So what's the result of a proper study that the man, the woman, the child of God may be totally complete? What does that mean? The word complete also means mature. Bible study and proper use of the word will help a Christian grow and mature in his relationship with God. There's nowhere to grow except through Bible study and prayer. Any Christian who's serious about being ready for the closing scenes of Earth's history will be spending a lot of time developing a relationship with God through Bible study and prayer. So friends, why are we going to study the Bible? I think we need to study the Bible to keep us sane in a crazy, crazy world where people are losing their mental health. Here's an amazing quote I want to share with you. There's nothing more calculated to energize the mind and strengthen the intellect than the study of the word of God. If God's word was studied as it should be, mankind would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character and a stability of purpose that are rarely seen in these times. Friends, here is the formula to energize your mind, to strengthen your brain, and it's done in the study of God's word. And I want to tell you that I've tried this and I want to tell you that the word of God has been a great blessing in my life and the more I've memorized scripture, the better my life has gone. All right, I have a poem that I want to share with you. And the author of this poem, I actually believe, is with us tonight. And I'll tell you at the end who wrote this poem. 
I'm going to call it the Daniel Wrap, and it's based on Daniel chapter 6. So Daniel stood in the lion's den, but he wasn't the least afraid, because Daniel had closed the lion's mouths. He answered when Daniel prayed. But I think he heard those lions growl from their mouths that God closed tight. Oh, they looked at him with their hungry eyes, but they weren't allowed to bite. All night long they paced that den with their great big restless feet, for they were starved. The food was there, but they weren't allowed to eat. The saliva dripped from their hungry mouths and their stomachs hurt all night. Ah, they looked at Daniel with their hungry eyes, but they weren't allowed to bite. Daniel prayed in the lion's den, and he prayed there all night through. And just as soon as it was light, the king came down there too. And Daniel cried, an angel closed the lion's mouths last night. Oh, they looked at me with their hungry eyes, but they weren't allowed to bite. The king was glad and the king rejoiced when he heard what Daniel said. And he ordered all those wicked men to be thrown in the den instead. And the lions leaped and the lions roared and it was an awful sight. For God had opened the lions' mouths and now they were allowed to bite. The Bible says that we will all stand in the lion's den someday. This earth will be the den I'm in and the lions will all be men. And they will try to destroy the children of God and they'll hunt for them day and night. And they'll look at us with their angry eyes, but they won't be allowed to strike. And I hope the day will come when you will stand the den with me and will pray to Daniel's God and wait patiently as Daniel did when God sent an angel bright to close the lion's mouths so they weren't allowed to bite. Friends, that amazing poem comes from a book of poems by Pastor Bill Blundell. And Pastor Bill Blundell and his wife Lynn are with us here tonight in this seminar. Bill, thank you so much and Lynn for allowing me to use that poem, which is uh, such a blessing and I know the children would have really enjoyed that. Friends, we're at our last lesson question. Question 20, is it your desire to be a faithful Daniel? by developing a deep personal relationship with God through Bible study and prayer so that you might be prepared for the closing scenes of earth's history. Well, friends, I'm going to invite you to put yes there because all great decisions are based on small decisions. And uh, I really believe that. Can I ask you just to direct your attention to the screen? I've got some very important things to say as we wrap up Daniel chapter one to six. Please, please look at the screen. There will come a time, friends, very, very soon when God's faithful people will be tested by governments around the world. Remember that we are never alone. Like Daniel, God will send his angels to protect us just like he does for his sleeping children who sleep safe in the arms of God. How do we get our relationship with Jesus Christ started? I'd like to share with you eight simple steps. You might like to write them down here quickly under question 20 or catch them later or take a photo or get it on YouTube, I don't know. I think you've got to have a plan before you go to sleep about how you're going to have that devotional time with God the next morning. Some people are fouls, they stay up late and they want to do their Bible study late at night. Others are owls, they're up scratching around three or four o'clock in the morning. Some are foul owls and can get by on three or four hours a night. They're amazing people. They're probably the people who go to sleep at the wheel of the car. So friends, I'm recommending morning is best, I think, is your freshest. I'm going to ask you tonight, what's your favorite Bible version that you like to read? Many people say, oh, I use this one or that one. That means they don't really have a, a Bible version that they like or they don't really have a Bible that they read. If you're going to study the Bible, then I'd recommend a deep Bible study be in the King James Version or the New King James like we're using for this series. Um, in terms of devotional reading or getting to know God's Word, I think the New Living Translation is an excellent version. There's the New Century Version on the screen. There's the Contemporary English Version and the English Standard Version. I think that's the old good news for modern men that came out in the 60s. Friends, if you're a beginner and you've really never had a time with God in the morning, I'm asking you to sit up in bed 
in the morning um, and start in the Gospel of Mark. Why? There's just 16 chapters. He doesn't waffle. He gives you the short version. If your uh, partner's there and starts complaining, I say, well, what are you doing? Just say to them, I'm praying for you. I'm reading God's word and I'm going to have a prayer for you. And pretty soon they'll go quiet and they'll roll over and go back to sleep. If you're an intermediate person, you've studied in the past, maybe you're now out of the habit. I'm asking you to set up a dedicated study desk somewhere in the house where you can go uh, and have a table with commentaries and be able to read it. Lots of resources online today, Bible dictionaries, commentaries, um, amazing books. Um, yeah, so I don't think we've ever been uh, so well blessed with resources. In terms of prayer, take time to pray for yourself and your family and uh, also make a prayer list of others to pray for. And I do that. I pray for about 40 people on my prayer list. And then if God's not answering any of my prayers, particularly on that particular day, as I go through and tick and mark off the names I'm praying for, then I know that God is answering the prayers for other people. Friends, we now need to review that we have done, what have we learned in the stories of Daniel 1 to 6? I'm going to go through this at 100 miles an hour. Please stay with me and then I'm going to relate it to what we are doing today in these last days. Here are the six tests found in Daniel 1 to 3. Daniel 1 is the dietary test. We learn to put God first and that obedience to God's diet laws brings health. How would that relate today to these days of the COVID pandemic? Friends, I'm asking you a question. Do you maintain a natural high immunity level in your body with a plant-based diet of veggies and water? Remember, Daniel was on a plant-based or vegan diet, and this helped his mind stay absolutely sh sharp, not clogging up his arteries with cholesterol, not being on dairy products or meat, and eating the waste products found, the purines found in meat. And so friends, this is a very, very important point. Most people will never get to this place, but the first great test in our lives is can you overcome in the area of diet? Eve and Adam fell, Daniel overcame, and so did Jesus, and so did uh, the apostle Peter in the New Testament. Then there's the dream test in Daniel chapter 2 that prayer brings answers and God's kingdom is on the way. How does Daniel 2 relate to today? I'm asking you, do you believe in the second coming of Christ and do you act each day as if Jesus is really coming back as soon as possible? Do you order your day based on this might be your last day on planet Earth? I don't think many people do. So that would mean that I would start thinking about who I could witness to in my family, to over the fence to my neighbours, to people at work, to uh, people that I interact with in social media, etc. You and I need to know that Jesus is coming very, very soon and we need to act like we believe it. Make an impact on your day. Ask God to give you that sense of the nearness of the coming of Jesus. In Daniel chapter 3, we had the false worship test that we are never alone and we never should worship falsely. How does that relate to where we are today? Friends, you and I need to resist any uh, enforced substitute, any enforced substitute day of worship. I want you to think about that. And next week, we are going to look at that very topic in lesson number nine. We're going into Daniel 7. Resist any enforced substitute day of worship. All right, in terms of Daniel 4, the madness test of King Nebuchadnezzar, we found that God hates pride and arrogance, that obedience to the true God gives a healthy mind. Friends, we need good mental health today, and that follows by fully obeying the God of heaven. So we want to keep our bodies in full health and a full immunity. Then you need to keep a strong immunity in your mind. And we've already given you a quote showing you that the reading of God's word will strengthen your mind and toughen your resolve. In Daniel 5, it was the writing test. We've learned never to mix truth and error. God hates the mixing of truth and error, and God is judging our lives, the handwriting on the wall. Man, a man, a tickle or parson, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. King Belshazzar, you're a spiritual lightweight. Your kingdom is entered, ended, and Cyrus the Great is outside the gates. What does that mean for today, friends? We need to wake up and learn that we're living in the actual day of judgment. And our probationary time is nearly over. Did you know that the judgment begins with the house of God? First Peter 4, 17. 
Yes, Christians are judged first to give non-Christians extra time to find a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then tonight, Daniel 6, what was it? It was the death test, a death decree. We learned to never stop praying. Daniel kept praying all through the crisis and that we are to keep up true worship because soon true worship will be um, taken away from us. What can we learn from Daniel 6 for today? Friends, the answer is that we need to keep the original biblical day of worship. Why do I say that? Because we need to keep up true worship, the true and original worship of God, which is to worship on the original biblical day of worship, which is the seventh day of the week. If you need more details on that, go to Genesis chapter 2 and read verses 1 to 3 and go to the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, and read verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. Let's go to the um, uh, and answer the theme questions. Who was Darius the Mede really? Darius could be the uncle and father-in-law to Cyrus, whose real name might have been Cyaxares II. Where were Daniel's three friends? Well, we don't know. Had it been crucial, Daniel would have mentioned it. Why were the laws of the Medes and Persians so unchangeable? The Medes and Persian laws made it impossible to undo even what royalty had done. Now, I told you I was going to give you an answer. And seeing you're nearly all here, I think we've got all 47 screens still here. I better give it to you. Friends, I found out in my study that what was happening in the kingdom of the Medes and Persians was that kings were being assassinated then the new pretenders to the throne would step up and be made king. Then they would undo the laws, especially if they were businessmen, they would undo the laws of the previous king that had hurt their business. So eventually the Medes brought in a law that the king's law, the law of the Medes and then the law of the Persians could not be altered in any way. And this was to safeguard the king from assassination and attack and undermining by those who wanted the laws changed. I found that fascinating. I hope you would also find that of interest. Well, what is the secret of Daniel's prayer habit of three times a day? Daniel gives us a surefire method of keeping in contact with God daily. In fact, morning, noon and night or evening. What's the theme of Daniel chapter 6? This chapter is telling us to worship God correctly no matter what the cost. Friends, thank you so much for uh, just coming through the quiz with me tonight. We're in lesson uh, number 8 and just putting your name on the envelope. Let's do the three response questions. Is it clear to you from tonight's lesson that a relationship with God is the most important thing in the world? I want to ask those of you who are not ticking any boxes tonight to answer this in your heart. Is a relationship with God the most important thing in your world? And if not, why not? And what are you going to do about it? I'm putting pressure on you tonight, friends. I don't think we can leave it any later. What's the cosmic clock saying in terms of the second coming of Jesus? How about this? 11.59 p.m. and 50 seconds plus and counting. Number two. Is it your desire to spend quality time with God so that you might develop this relationship and be prepared for the last days? Please put a tick in that box or make that decision in your heart before God tonight. Number three, are you keen enough to try and start or even restart your relationship with God first thing in the morning? I'm asking you to put a tick in box number three. Friends, just set the alarm five minutes early and start off with a, a scripture and a prayer. You can build to 10 minutes the week after and 15 minutes the week after. Just start small. Keep that Bible, that favorite Bible by your bed. When the alarm goes off, sit up and don't say, uh, good Lord, it's morning. Say, good morning, Lord. All right, let's go through the quiz questions. Number one, true or false? Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because he was caught cheating the king. Hmm. Don't remember reading that in Daniel chapter six, true or false? Number two, the issue that got Daniel into trouble was his obedience to the law of God. True or false? Number three, to Daniel, the most important thing in the world was his relationship with God. True or false? Number four, a relationship with God is developed by spending much time in Bible study and prayer with God. True or false? 
Number five, the reasons the lions did not eat Daniel is that they were not very hungry that day. I think we covered that, didn't we, in great detail tonight, true or false. All right, well, it's time to, uh, to fly through the answers. Number one, the answer is false. Number two, the answer is true. Number three, the answer is true. Number four, the answer is true. And number five, the answer is false. Our answers tonight, kids, if you're marking off your answers, is number one is false, number two, true, number three, true, number four, true, and number five, false. Two false and three trues. Give yourself a score out of five. Friends, what did we learn tonight in our wall of truth in Daniel chapter six? We learned about the lion's den test, the death decree test, and Daniel stayed obedient to God even under the death decree test. How do you think you'd go in the death decree test? You can go really well if you have a solid relationship with God. You'll be there. All right. I'd like to give yourself all a round of applause. I will uh, applaud you for actually completing Daniel uh, chapters one to six. We have finished the stories. You know, friends, people just see them as stories. They're not actually stories. As I've just gone through those six points, they are actually templates on how to handle the crises in the last days. Let all the people say, amen. Friends, every week I've said, just join us, just come in and fill it in as we go. I want to warn you that if you just lob up next week, we love you and we welcome you. But next week's lesson can probably not be just taken in on the night. I am telling you there's a blue exhibit there, historical exhibit you're going to need to read. I haven't got time to read it to you. I'm begging you to spend some time this weekend doing this lesson. This would be one of the most important lessons you can ever do. It's called The Little Horn Power of Daniel chapter 7. And so I'm asking you tonight to pledge to yourself to read Daniel chapter 7 through first and then do the lesson. It's a big lesson. It's going to take a lot of time and there'll be a lot of detail. I'm going to blow you away with what we're going to share next week. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Daniel is such an inspiration to us tonight. He was as true to you as the needle to the pole of a compass. Father, tonight we want to have that faith, that calmness and that reassurance that the God of heaven will look after us if we obey you every step of the way. I pray a blessing for those who have tonight decided that they want a stronger or robust walk with Jesus and that some of them are going to um, open their Bibles and pray tonight and some of them are going to do it in the morning. Father, they will need Holy Spirit power because Satan works so hard to stop people who follow Jesus from ever getting started in a devotional life. Be with all those dear people tonight, whether they're here in our Zoom program tonight or whether they're watching this on YouTube at a later time. I ask that angels that excel in strength will come down and strengthen them and give them hope and courage and resilience to be able to connect with the God of heaven every day is my prayer for everyone who hears this. In Jesus' powerful and precious name, let all the people say, Amen. been listening to Prophecy Seminar, the book of Daniel with Pastor David Price. For more information about this series, you can visit the YouTube page, True Blue SDA, all one word. That's True Blue SDA. This program has been brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio.